Hello, everyone. This is Seth with the World of Paleoanthropology, and it has been such an exciting week to be a science communicator in this field. I mean, with all the announcements going on out of Rising Star in South Africa, if you have not been following along, you've been living under more rock than possibly Naledi has been buried under, and you need to check out what's been going on. So today, to talk about some of the news that's been happening, we have Genevieve von testing her back on the show. And the reason for that is, if you recall, she is an expert on geometric signs, symbology, the like. And one of the announcements that came out of Rising Star was that Naledi is possibly responsible for these engravings that are found in what we're now calling the burial chamber. So we're here with Genevieve, and we're going to be talking about these um, purported signs, what they might mean, how they got there, and it's going to be exciting. So let's get into it. So how are you doing today? I'm so well. Thank you for having me back. I mean, we were going to do more, but then it's like, well, obviously now we need to do like the Naledi special, right? <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So no, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm it's. It's exciting times in paleoanthropology, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm here. I'm ready. What do you, where do you want to start? I mean, I think that's, I, <laughs> there's so much to talk about, right? I know it's, it's definitely hard to start. So I think, uh, you know, as I just mentioned, for those who may not know, Naledi, and I will be showing images as we're talking. So just assume people are looking at the engravings themselves. Uh, there are many, there's this whole, pillar almost and a wall that has been purportedly uh flat, not flattened out but uh like prepared yeah almost yeah. and there are engravings on it that aren't things that you know just something occurred as it scrapped the wall passing by these are engravings that are term that they are using called meaning making i believe is the term that we are using for these symbols, they're meaning-making symbols. And uh, as someone who studies what we, I think can all agree is art, a lot of people are trying to throw that term at these engravings just right off the bat from the beginning. You know, what are we trying to tell people these are versus what is being shown scientifically? Are we looking at the earliest art right now? Well, oh gosh, I mean, it's like this huge, huge philosophical debate. What is art, right? Yeah, okay. I know, right? Okay, so within the field, we kind of, all of us researchers have sort of like this tacit understanding that we use the word art to describe what we're seeing when we're talking to people more outside the field because it's easy it's it's this little everybody's so oh okay like you know what art is but of course our definition of art generally comes from the western tradition of art right so when we think of art it could be the mona lisa in the louvre it could be banksy on a wall but like we have definitions of what we consider art and um realistically I tend to I like to step back and talk more about like visual like visual or like visual marks graphic communication so the idea that I mean I think what they're trying to get at with the word like the expression meaning making is the idea that they weren't just making these thoughtlessly like that there was some intention or purpose to why they were making them this does not necessarily mean, you know, Neo was here or like there's a sonnet engraved on a wall or, or <laughs> anything like that, right? Or, or, or I mean, it was self-portrait, Ella Picasso. No, um, but, you know, so I think art can be a little problematic sometimes. And I think in a way, it's almost better to pull back and look at the idea of visual markers, right? Because that can also be things like danger or a stop sign, or, you know, like the yield triangle, like we have yield triangles all over the world. We all know what they are. I can literally, I've driven, I've driven like seven or eight countries in the world, including a couple pretty sketchy ones. Um, but they all have, they all have yield signs, right? Like, you, you know, so there, those are also visual markers. And so I, 
think when we're what I'm looking at the non figurative stuff or these more abstract simplistic if you want to call them that um like signs we we they're not necessarily art like aesthetically pleasing or being made to beautify um we so i think how's that i think that's maybe the best way to describe it is art's a really simple way to be like yeah i study these marks that we find on walls or painted or engraved you know yada yada yeah like that's kind of the the first step but yeah obviously we can dig into it a lot deeper but i would pull back and say these are visual graphic marks so there's something you can see they are a graphic mark so there's something physical that was made on the surface i think that's like we can all agree they're there and again we got to get into whether how do we even tell they're intentional because that, <laughs> that's part of this too but we'll get there but yeah so there appears to be visual marks on a pillar in this part of the cave is i think pretty safe whether it's art or not would be you know maybe more open to the the critic's eye how's that art is in the eye of the beholder you know exactly, exactly. right so now factually speaking yeah when you enter this chamber there is yeah. as we've mentioned this pillar and there are engravings on it mm -hmm. now the question is not are they there that's that's not the question the question is how did they get there and if they got there in a way that was intentional what do they mean yeah now you've been studying geometric signs for a bit do you think oh, yeah. we will ever know what they mean Oh my goodness, <laughs> there's a big question. Okay, <laughs> well, I, I think if you don't mind, I'm gonna pull back for one really quick sec because I think Absolutely. the question of art and everything I think really plays into this um, as does, so basically, yeah, as you said, in a nutshell, really far into a cave with a species that was not thought of capable of doing any of this stuff, we have what appear to be intentional marks on pillars, not just the one pillar, there's a couple other spots too um which also have engraved marks or appear to and um so i i think now i'm i was one of the reviewers of the actual academic article so i have read what uh lee Berger and his colleagues wrote academically um and then of course there's also the public announcements of things and so i think that actually might be a good place to start which is the article itself was quite careful in how they approach this and, and so i do want to because i've seen other situations like this where i mean they are the first to admit that studies need to be done to understand mm -hmm. what is going on so think of this more as like a flag plant like hey everyone we got this thing we don't know what this thing means yet but we wanted you all to know about it um and so i think in that sense i appreciated the fact that they they didn't go too far down the road of you know these are definitively this or this is what it means like so so if academically i think they did a nice job of kind of navigating that we want to announce this to our colleagues we want to open this up for discussion but we're not going to try and pretend we already know everything because we don't mm. and so they were cool that way i liked that i really appreciate that because i think sometimes academics can get a little overly excited with with what they think they found and they they almost like overly they overly interpret before they have the data to back it up. So I appreciated that. On the other side of this, they, I mean, Lee and his team are really big on science communication. Obviously, I love science communication. You love science communication. But that's always where it gets a little tough too, because you're trying to explain, just like literally we were talking about with the word art, right? I also right. use the word art when I'm talking to the public because they're like, oh, pictures on a wall. Like everybody instantly knows what you're talking about, right? Um, but I think that, and again, I work with wonderful journalists all over the world and print, radio, television, who are trying so hard to explain these concepts in ways that make sense to people who've maybe never heard of this before and who are literally stumbling across paleoanthropology and like ancient species and the origins of art for the first time and have very limited space usually to explain it. So mm -hmm. I think part of the, and again, pushback is good pushback is science we always want to be questioning everything and we never want to just take anything without being like okay let's see the data let's do the work let's do the analysis let's debate that but i think some of the critique that i have seen is almost more what the media has said 
than what the article said or even what Lena's colleagues said. So I think part of this is again the 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 media is trying to share this, um, and sometimes I think it can get a little overly excited. How's that? And I've had it happen to me too, where I there was one time where they were like, you know, Ice Age writing, and I was like, whoa back up the bus like this is not writing that far back but they're trying to explain it in a way that makes sense to the public right so right. i was like whoa 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 but we can't use the w word because that makes me weird like the alien the people who think aliens built the pyramids like we can't talk about <laughs> writing <laughs> i was like i don't want to be in their corner um so you know it but that's where you can see they're looking for easy words to explain it to a public who may not know and, and i right. think that's the problem all of us science communicators are always facing and I love the fact that at the Rising Star site, they've been very open sourcey almost about like the way that they're doing the science there and sharing with the public and bringing people along for the journey, which is very exciting. Um, but th it's that balance because then there's also kind of like, honestly, this, I mean, this is a whole other topic, but like, what is the purpose of academia in the 21st century? How do mm -hmm. we do the research? How do we explain the research to the public? I mean, our public is a very well-educated, well-informed public now, right? Like right. these are these are not, you know, sort of like medieval peasants who are like wanting to burn anything down they don't understand. Like people are pretty smart and pretty educated. So, and they're interested because this is literally the story of us, right? Which mm -hmm. is incredible and beautiful. And we want people to know. I mean, this is our collective history. So I think a little bit of the pushback i mean again some of the academics have raised some really great points about like hey what about this what about that i think that's going to be the next stage with all of this and again i'm not speaking to the burials i'm not a burial expert um so i wouldn't want to touch on that too much i thought again the fact they're all in the same position was really interesting and there was other things that seemed reasonable to me again probably more work is needed and then we'll see what happens um but certainly with the art i felt like some of the pushback was almost just more that folks didn't maybe completely understand what had been done, what needs to be done, um, what the researchers were saying versus kind of like what the media was saying, um, and then how do you navigate that? So I think that's just some important context for listeners to sort of keep in mind is that sometimes headlines can be a bit overly excited. <laughs> right. It's not I, that... It's not that we want it to say that necessarily. And sometimes we cringe too, just in case anybody's ever wondered where you're like, oh, really? <laughs> Did you use that word, really? Um, so it's, it, but it's hard because we want to share. So there's the balance with that, right? And I feel like when we're talking about Naledi and any of their possible behaviors or capabilities, we're kind of where we were with Neanderthals maybe 20 years ago in the way that people are talking and their attitudes. You know, it's very, Mm -hmm. Well, it could only be us. It could only right. be big-brained humans. It could only be... So I think there's also a lot of the news and headlines are, as you said, they're trying to really grab people's attention yeah. by saying, oh, tiny-brained hominid changed everything about our understanding. And, ev you know, every time we find anything, it apparently yeah. changes our complete understanding of I know, I know, evolution. right? So. literally that but <laughs> at the same time this is a really exciting time of healing up Absolutely. for reals right like this actually <laughs> is <laughs> um but honestly it's almost like what's i do because i've done i did some of the interviews with like scientific american and these scientists and all that kind of stuff um just commenting on it and you know i think what it was the way i was explaining it to them was it's almost like we've been as you said with neanderthals right like this debate about human uniqueness which mm. is honestly at the heart of a lot of this is but we're special we, we, we we're, we're the ones who do these things other guys don't do that that's us right and so again with neanderthal our, our poor maligned cousins um you know that we've been marching though in this direction and people's minds are more open because Hmm. we've already started to expand out um and and i think so much of that has to do with neanderthals potentially now we also have denisovans making marks on portable objects um you know the dates in africa keep getting pushed back on things like there's lots going on Cima de las Hoyas. i mean out of puerca there in spain as well um which we'll talk, we can talk about in a second but like so it's 
there's sort of, I think we talked about this a little bit last time, like the, the checklist of symbolic modern behavior, right, was sort of this traditional thing where it's like, do they bury their dead? Do they use color symbolism? Do they wear jewelry? Do they make portable artifacts with non utilitarian marks on them and the pinnacle was cave art right like that was always kind of like and cave art um and they were always like well even if neanderthals do some of those other things they don't do this therefore you know we're still special right. but then now it's like the evidence is mounting that neanderthals also did cave art as well in multiple sites and in different places and times so i i feel like 20 years ago, if, if this had come out, I mean, I think the field would have pretty much told the Rising Star team to go jump in a lake. Like, they would have been like, yeah. you're insane. They would have been in the corner with the alien people. That's where they would have been. <laughs> so, but, Absolutely. Um, right? yeah, there's still people who I think are putting them there, even I know. I know. with today's I know. standards. Yeah, and it's like, it's it's so fascinating. But this is where I feel like the way we need to approach this is that this is the start of a very exciting new conversation. Like, like this is not, we're not at the mic drop, we're at the beginning. Like, it's like, we've just cracked this door open. Now we get to go through and explore. And I think part of this is those larger questions of where and when and who mm -hmm. made the first graphic marks. Um, I mean, there's already like little earlier examples floating around, right? Like in, you know, in, in Java and Indonesia, there's like 500,000 year old zigzag on a shell, which is a very well dated, well excavated modern site. Um, there's a site in Bulgaria called Kozanika, which also has like 500,000 year old marks on bones. Um, and it's pretty well dated as well, from my understanding. I know I know the person who's the project director there and, and again there's it's they're using volcanic dating so they they date when um basically when different eruptions happen and every single volcano has its own unique chemical signature so you can actually figure out the dates like a before and after so i believe right. it's sort of dated to a fairly decent range there so we have a couple hints of half a million um, you know, there's, there's other things floating around and there was no homo sapien at half a million. There wasn't even the Anderthals at half a million. So <laughs> we're talking, you know, homo erectus ish, like we're already right, starting right. to push back. And, and at this point too, we don't know where Naledi fits into the family tree, which is also incredibly intriguing. Um, so that was how I've been sort of saying to people about what, what makes this so interesting is I feel like Naledi is almost just going to kick this whole conversation off. Like, I think we're going to start, we're going to start this whole new approach to the field, which I think we desperately need, which is that we're still dragging, kicking and screaming a lot of our ideas from the 20th century with us into the new millennium. And I think now we, we really do need to almost as a field, just be like, okay, <laughs> how do we deal with this? Like, I think we've moved past the point of homo sapiens are the only ones who made meaningful marks on things um right, portable right. wall art whatever but that we've got other species behaving in very intentional potentially symbolic ways um so what does that mean and can we start to approach this differently with like i think how did i word it for like scientific american i think it was something like what i was basically saying was like we want to be scientifically cautious like, that's the thing. We don't just want to, like, jump into this. But we also, I think we need to be scientifically cautious and yet open-minded. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and, and to me, I mean, that's what science is, right? It's about curiosity. And, and so, you know, from my perspective, I've been more like, okay, so this is our start point. We've got, we've got these potential marks. Now, how do we study it? What would we actually do? to operationalize this like let's if we're in the field if we really wanted to test this um and be really rigorous about it too um you know i have a colleague who said how did he word it you know extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence right uh, yes that has yes. been thrown at me uh, a few times yep. as i've been reporting on this yes yeah and, and so i think and but i agree so yes we, but but we're in this amazing time where we have so much technology at our disposal <laughs> like like i already have like a shopping list of things that like we could do in that cave um in order to actually really address these questions now we're never gonna know anything 100 
it's just that is the nature of what it is. But I think we could certainly either shore up the argument well or refute the argument by using like all of these wonderful tools and methods that we've developed. Absolutely. And you know, there are so many people who I've heard saying, oh, well, they didn't do this test, they didn't do that, why aren't there dates yet, why aren't there this? And I think going through some of that and exploring the way that the team will or might do that would be a really great idea for us to show people, mm -hmm. as well as maybe explain why those things weren't done at the start. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people are wondering, why aren't there dates? Why didn't they just come out with the dates first? Uh, yeah. So maybe if we can address that and talk a little bit about what it will require to actually do that um, mm -hmm. will maybe help a lot of people sway their thinking on whether these were human yeah. made or not. Absolutely. No, it, it, that's that's literally, I think that is almost what Naledi, that's almost the beauty of this is it's such a great opportunity to get like super nerdy and into like the hard <laughs> science of like, how do we do this? Right. Cause that's like, exactly. that's my, that's what I think is so fun is, is that here's the challenge. Here's the mystery. Okay. How do we solve it? What do we do? Mm -hmm. So how do you want to do this? Do you want to hit me with some of the critiques people have? Because I feel like we almost want to put on our, our archaeologist hats here for a minute and literally start walking through, okay, if this was, this is the challenge, this is the question, how do we test it? Um, I think we should almost just walk through it as though it's our site and we could do it. So the number one thing that I've heard yeah. And you know, keeping in mind everyone who's you know watching this, I hear from people who are at the level where they could have been working at the site to people who just learned yeah. what anthropology was yesterday. Yeah. So one of the main things that I get is how do we know that Joe Schmo was not just in there 10 years ago, yeah. carved these, and he's laughing in his armchair somewhere at the big ruckus that's being made right now about his little doodles in the cave. Yeah. Well, I mean, A, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And where is it? There actually are some sites in Europe where things of that like that have happened, where a, you know, somebody did like even just innocently or whatever, like do something. So again, there are these these occasions that occur. And so this is where I think, especially when you're starting at such a beginning point, we do need to be really open-minded when I'm saying that in all ways, which is also being really open-minded to this could be a complete hoax, right? This right. could, so I think it's almost, that's the full spectrum. Everything from hoax, 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 they're modern to holy smokes, Naledi was telling us the secrets of the universe or the answer, they know <laughs> the answer to the, they yeah, know the they question, know the, the question, right? They know that, yeah, they know the answer is yeah. 42, but you know, what's the question, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but you know, like that's like sort of our spectrum we're dealing with here. Um, and I think it is really important to ad address all of that. Um, just so it helps people who maybe aren't working in academia or in research, I think it's important to understand that there's different types of articles that, that researchers publish. I would consider this one to be what I would call a preliminary paper. Um, this is not what I would call the big synthesis declaration of like, we have, we have, we understand everything, the end, right? So what this was, my understanding is that the intention of this paper was, as I said, more of a flag plan, which was just saying, hey, we found these things. We're more at the beginning. We are. We now need to go study these. But these are surprising and interesting enough that we did want to report on them. So I would say that that's maybe important to understand is that the, the type of study that people were like, you know, where's the dates? Where's this? It can take years. Like right. it could literally be like two or three years from now before all those results are in. Um, you know, different tests can take a long time. Things fail. You might have to go retest. Like things get contaminated. Like there's so much to do, and it's incredibly difficult conditions to work in. So there's a lot of different reasons why. I think they decided. I mean, again, I'm just guessing. I'm not them, but I, I think this was always designed to be more of a, like I said, a conversation starter. This mm -hmm. wasn't them trying to say we know everything. It's more like, wow, we were not expecting this. <laughs> There's marks <laughs> on a pillar in this chamber where we were not expecting to find them. 
And so I think that's certainly, that's the way I've interpreted the article is that they they were very clear in the article as well that like, hey, we got a lot of work to go do. Like this work is right. not done and it needs to be done. So that would be how I would interpret what they said is not that they're doing sloppy science or that they're trying. And again, I mean, they're, it's not, they don't strike me as like, I don't think they're trying to sensationalize anything. I think it's more, they were just trying to get the information out there to start with, especially because my understanding again, is that because this cave is more open source and has generally invited the public to be a part of it, that this is now going to be part of the conversation moving forward is I think they they're planning the impression I got was that they want the public to be a part of this process of discovery mm -hmm. um even with like the testing and all these different things which to me is so fun right like who doesn't want to go behind the scenes with Indiana Jones right like that's basically <laughs> what you get to do I mean it's kind of like the boring stuff here we're like we're sorry there's no fedoras and whips but you know there is some good <laughs> science being done back there um, so yeah, that would be, I think, I would just sort of say, I think that might be how we need to approach this is more like we're at the start. They're not, they were, they weren't trying to say they had the answers. That wasn't my impression. What right. about you? Have you, have you read the actual like article? I, ha I have. Yes. And I a hundred percent agree with you. And I think that it is something that is very misplaced right now. That is, uh, by a lot of people that they think that the team is trying to say bam this is it here are our answers when really i think it is more of a well chuck this is what there is uh mm -hmm. how about we open it so you can do your own work and your interpretation and then we'll discuss it mm -hmm. um i i've had multiple people come up and message me and say well you know i would have done these tests and yeah. my response is well now maybe hopefully you can do those tests yeah, uh, that it's open source and you can compare your results and see what there is to see. I don't think that, you know, Lee since 2013 and the Rising Star team started has been, I mean, he was live tweeting it and it was on Facebook. He's been yeah. open about it the whole time. And I think not to bring in a subject that we really don't need to be broaching upon right now. But I think one thing that makes a lot of people uncomfortable is how involved National Geographic and Disney are with yeah. possibly pushing the narrative a little bit on how he's publicizing it. So and like, yeah, going of, back to media kind of thing, right? Exactly, how the media yeah. is representing everything. Um, and yeah. I think if people took that away and just went back to Lee's been doing this, for 10 years before that even mm -hmm. occurred yeah this is the evidence is the same and it's what's there yeah. and it's there for everyone to look at and to test now it's not just lee's interpretation anyone yeah. can go well not anyone obviously yeah. you know to be under yeah. a certain size i think um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah no i think that's a really that's a really solid interpretation of it and and again i mean gosh it's such a hard balance because we need people like Nat Geo and Disney, though, in a way to help mm. us get the word out, right? Like, if we want the public around the world to be able to participate and, you know, spectate and maybe even, you know, get involved in some way or another, we do need these big platforms to partner with us. Like, it's such a hard balance, isn't that? Absolutely. Because, I mean, it's a balance I'm constantly trying to figure out, too, you know, which is that, I mean, to me, I, I I love doing the science, but I love sharing it like just as much, yeah. you know. And again, yeah. and again, no offense, I love our audience, but I mean, and kids, oh, I love going into classrooms; they're the best, <laughs> right? So you know, again, it's like trying to figure out how do you engage people without over sensationalizing. It's it's a really yeah. tough balance. Yeah, and I think honestly, what's going to really make the difference here is probably going to be how it goes forward. Mm -hmm. Like in the sense, okay, we've seen how it started. And, um, but, you know, I mean, the, the internet and like, I mean, there's so much accessibility now. And I, my right. feeling has also been very much that, I mean, even from what I saw what Lee been saying was that now other researchers can look at this, like that is his plan is my understanding. So, you know, I think that's where, that's where we're at is that now we get to go do those tests and mm -hmm. now we will get to see those results, but that's going to take some time. 
And I think the other, I'm betting the other feeling probably too, was that there's no way they could kind of keep that under wraps for the next two to three years. Yeah. Right. I'm, so you I might mean, as well just say what it is. So it, it's not slipping out in like the wrong way kind of thing. Like there's really like, so just, just get it out there. Here's what it is. <laughs> now let's use this as a conversation starter. So yeah. So if, if, if we were going to put on our archaeology hats, um, what yeah. tests, what were people suggesting to you? Do you remember what they were suggesting? Well, let me actually give me a moment. I can pull up something specific. One, I know one person was trying to discuss with me, and I know this has been proven on various levels, uh, that Rising Star is now a dry cave uh, and has been for quite some time. They were wondering how we knew that watermarks were not responsible for making those lines. Uh, oh, okay. okay yeah so well let's, let's start yeah let's do let's do a little like rock art 101 here okay so most of the caves in europe are made in limestone it's like the one not made in limestone but the marks are made in limestone so limestone is quite soft or even there's been a few caves i've been in too where literally the cave walls are almost like gooey they almost have like clay on them or it's called mondmilch which is like a type of uh um uh, sort of sediment that builds up on the walls and you can literally run your fingers through it and make marks like it is super easy to make marks in those in, in those particular contexts dolomite is very hard like very 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 hard so water would not make marks in it the same way it would just not be easy and it certainly wouldn't be these weird angular marks like i don't think it, it like again um i should this is actually a good place to start so because again if you're studying like bison or mammoths or even human shapes, like it's really easy to be like, why look, it's a bison, right? Like there's, it, it's a figurative thing. When you're dealing with geometric non-figurative stuff, you are actually facing, like my first question often is, okay, is this even human made? Like that literally is, is the place you have to start sometimes. Um, and sometimes it's not. So um one particular instance that I love that uh, I always kind of keep in uh, the back of my mind is like there's a there's a cave uh, in France called Bellard where there's perfect cave bear claws down the um, like down this one wall and there's like so it looks like four lines in a row like it looks like oh wow this is a meaningful set of marks right but no it's cave bear claws and um but what you need to be able to tell is you have to look at it under a microscope and what you can see is the way the nails dig and drag is different than the way a tool a stone tool looks when it cuts through the cave wall isn't that interesting mm -hmm. so first of all you need a microscope which like a portable microscope that you can bring into a cave with you um and um so that's going to be number one number two yeah you need to know the hardness of the rock and so what this reminds me of is in portugal they have um rock art that has survived out in the elements which is crazy for twenty five thousand years in some cases and the reason why is because it's not limestone limestone would have crumbled and fallen apart long ago there it's a hard type of rock called schist and um, again, the, this is the kind where you have to go back and forth and back and forth and back. Like you, one, it's, you're barely going to ding it if you did it as a single line. Whereas with the limestone, with the mon milch and the caves, that you can do with your fingers or you can do lightly with a stone tool. This requires more time, more effort, and potentially more intentionality. Now... Again, this this another piece that's useful in here, and I saw this in some of the, I saw this in the actual article, um, and I've seen the pictures for it, which is that another thing that happens is sometimes you get natural cracks. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one, right? Like truly, sometimes they can almost fool you at first. And so, uh, yeah, because I study the geometric science, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make sure I'm not imagining stuff, basically, right? <laughs> like this, because again, like I said, it's, it's not a horse. A horse, you're like, oh, either it's a horse or it's not. Like, right, right. It, it's such a recognizable shape. This, you're like, okay, is this a natural crack or is it not? So one of the ways you try and determine if something is a natural crack before you get out your microscope is you look to see, does it cross either different types of rock or does it cross anything like a fossil? 
because a natural crack will go around it. It will not go through it. Mm -hmm. And so, because again, it's a different, it's a, it's a different hardness of material. So if you've got a little, the rock cracks, that's great, but it's not necessarily going to crack that fossil. Or if you've got say two different types of rock right side by side, the crack will probably stop. It won't go through into the other because that's say it's a harder type of rock or something. So you've got different layers. So that's in this particular cave, there are a couple instances where those lines cut right through fossils. And so I think that again is is an interesting preliminary. Again, I haven't seen this with my own eyes, like in person. So I'm just speculating. But based on the photos, that to me made me think it wasn't a natural crack, for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, number two watermarks would probably not be so angular and the i would have thought they would be probably more horizontal less vertical like there's just things about right, them that don't right. quite look right and it looks a little too jaggedy around the edges um and it doesn't look regular enough for animal scratching because i've seen bat scratches too which also mm -hmm. you know for mm -hmm. a second because they're smaller right and so you're like oh what's this little neat thing and you're like oh the bat scratch but <laughs> again until you see what almost looks like like under a microscope um and there's a couple people in the field like uh, francesco derico somebody's done some great work on this of looking at all the different what does it look like if you use this kind of stone tool what does it look like if it's an animal claw like so we've got wonderful examples of this is the way the edges look under a microscope and now we have the capacity to take pretty high powered portable microscopes with us. So this would be step one would be, you know, basically look at the edge and a natural, if it's a natural crack, it tends to be quite jagged. Right. Um, if it's an animal claw, certainly with the bears, they often start fairly blunt at the top because of the style of the claw. Whereas a stone tool almost comes down at more of a sharp pointy angle. Like there's, there's just different, and there's different ways you can tell. And also a natural crack is going to be very jaggedy um, versus if it's a stone tool, you're more likely to have it be smoother, not smooth. Um, or if it's very smooth, and this is a good one for the modern question people, if it was made with a modern tool, anything made with metal makes a completely different looking line under a microscope. So mm -hmm. again, that's where the modern metal tools make a smoother line again like so it's like all these gradients now obviously this isn't the perfect science this is all still a bit interpretive but i think we could definitely it's a really great place to start would be to be is it like was it made with metal is it a natural mark if you can rule those out then you're like okay somebody purposely dragged their tool of some kind up and down this and we think it's stone based on the edges of it but you know like there's things we can do and the fact it cuts through fossils say etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that's almost step one is is it human made or is it natural or is it an animal so that's like literally step one step two um would probably be the question of does it does it look like somebody just accidentally did it on the way by right mm -hmm. like you know right. like either something on their clothes scratched the wall or I mean, maybe somebody was, you know, bored during Great Aunt Neo's funeral. So <laughs> it was like just sort of doodling on the wall, right? Dude, killing yeah, yeah. Um, I'd be really sarcastic, but you understand what I'm saying. Like, so, of you know, course, yeah. and, and so I think that's the next question. And, and the material that is made of down there makes it much less likely that it was a very casual encounter with a wall that caused it. So again, you wouldn't hardly leave any mark at all if you brushed against it with your clothes or even ran your stone tool along it as you were walking by. It's not it, it's not going to really make that depth of line. So that's probably the next question is if they had to sit there and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, we're already seeing a little bit more intention. And now, and I think a really important thing though here too is to recognize that there are layers to meaning do you know what i mean like like recognizing that something is intentional is not the same as saying it has some very deep multi-layered meaning right right like those are very different questions and so the meaning part would definitely be a down the road piece so i think the first question is intentionality like once you've confirmed it was made by somebody um like it was you know, bipedal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Somebody bipedal with opposable thumbs made this. Um, 
And uh, then I think at that point, the next question would be, yeah, is it, is it, does it look doodle-like? Does it seem like there's more intentionality to it than that? Was it, yeah. So the fact that, but again, the fact they prepared some of the surfaces. So what they're talking right. about with that, and I've seen that in Europe as well, is that sometimes what they'll do is they'll basically take a stone and they pound the wall flat-ish. So it, they're preparing the wall so it's easier to, because if you've got a really jaggedy wall, how easy is it going to be to make marks? Right. Like you're like, I don't know if you tried to like make marks with like a stone <laughs> tool in another stone surface. You're it's bouncing all over the place. Like it's not so preparing the surface does make it easier. So the fact that there appears, and again, I haven't seen it with my own eyes, but the fact there appears to be surface preparation. Now we're talking about forethought. We're talking about planning. We're talking about the fact that if they went to the effort of preparing the surface, it sounds like it was intentional. Like, do you see where I'm going? Like, it's almost like right, you're, you're, right, you're starting absolutely. to build the argument up like little piece by little piece by little piece. Um, fun fact, and um, I think it was an article by Francesco Derrico and Chris Henschelwood where they were talking in there about the idea that doodling is actually culturally specific. I think I heard that, yeah. Yes, so even if they were doodling, um, they're doodling things they learned about through their culture, mm -hmm. which is which is just fast. So again, like even even doodling has a level of meaning if that if you want to go that right. right. So right, I think right. I think we need to if it, even if it wasn't done again with deep levels of thought, it still there still can be meaningful in the sense that even making the decision to doodle is not something that your average crow does, right? Or raven or something. And they've got good theory of mind going on. Like, so again, right. we need to look at this idea that one of the things that I think maybe the hominin line, so hominin is basically homo habilis down specifically, as opposed to hominid, which includes more. Now, they could be descended from another Australopithecus or Brethropus, who knows? I mean, we don't, we don't know at this point what right, their relationship right. is, right? Um, but, you know, I think that there's definitely a trend within the hominin line towards making graphic marks. That would be how I would word it. So I think that this is where, that, that, would, that would be how I would look at the wall. The other thing about that wall, which I'm intrigued by, and I'd, like, I'd be interested to see more about it, is it appears that there's super positioning. And so super positioning means it appears that they came back multiple times and did new engravings over old engravings. We see the same thing in Europe. Um, there's, you know, again, if you've got a particularly nice wall in a cave, sometimes <laughs> you have people come back three or four times, sometimes with like thousands of years between it too. It's amazing. Right. And um, so that ends up with some things are underneath other things, which are under, you know, so you get this layering of things and it appears visually at least, and again, this has to be studied, but it appears that there's super positioning on some of the walls, including that one that's behind your head <laughs> right yes. now right and so you can see that some of the engravings are filled in and some are have been freshened up right and you see the same thing in uh portugal too at foscoa obviously a lot younger more like 20 25,000 years but same thing where people went back and used the same rock faces and so when marks are first made in these walls they're very brilliant and white often as opposed to everything around them is darker. So they really stand out when they're first made. So this is where, again, you can see that from a visual aesthetic point of view, they might've liked the way it looked. Um, now I was reading in there, and from what I've heard too, is that it may be that they took some sediment from somewhere and rubbed it into the wall to actually right. darken the old marks and then made new ones. So again, these are things like, there's ways you can rebuild the order in which marks were made. Isn't that cool? It's not my specialty, mm -hmm. but there are people within our field who can do it. I've seen people do incredibly detailed studies at places like Chauvet, where they literally rebuilt a panel. Um, I can't remember. I feel like they rebuilt some animals, and they literally were like, this mark was made before this mark, which was made before this mark. Like, they <laughs> were able to be, they were literally able to rebuild the entire order of how That's those insane. images were made. So, and this has to do with what, what goes over or something else. Like, it's so this is where, again, you're not going to, one person can't do this. You need a team and you need a team with lots of different specialties so they can all come together. But I feel like the super positioning and um, also speaks to potentially like not only intentionality, but also there being some sort of pattern to them coming back to do mm -hmm. this, right? 
And again, you know, I'm, I'm being very careful about assigning too heavy layers of meaning to it. Um, obviously, if it is in a chamber where they were burying their dead, then, I mean, it does, at that point, it makes sense, kind of, that they would, you know, if they came back to bury a new individual, maybe there were certain things they did at the same time. And so that's, of course, speaking to a much larger idea of a culture and them having certain rituals or practices that they did that maybe went with the concept of burying their dead. Um, and I mean, that's, that's a whole big, that's a whole big kettle of fish right there. Um, right. And, and, but, but I feel like those are conversations we can start to have more once we know what we're dealing with. So I feel like mm -hmm. step one is if, if we're able to be like, oh, wow, okay, people came back at different times and then they did more stuff. This is great. Um, I believe I saw one place, I think, where there may have been a little bit of calcite that had actually grown over one of the lines. Oh, if so, the, that. yeah, yeah. If so, that could be uranium series dated potentially. So that's really cool. Um, I think also there are some really interesting ways now. Like, oh, there's so many cool things we can do, right? I was going to say, oh, I know people were like, how how do we know a human wasn't in there doing that? Well, it not definitive, but I think it would be super interesting. Um, you probably, I'm sure you've heard about fact that people like there's researchers now who have been literally pulling genetic material out of the dirt right, caves right. and rebuilding mm -hmm. people from it so i think it would be really interesting to do some dirt sampling to right, see absolutely. is is there any homo sapien genetic material in there that's not like the modern researchers who we know because again you can actually put those people you can you can sequence them and then get them out of the way and not and know it's not them so is there any homo sapien genetic like did anybody leave some hair or something mm -hmm. lying around in the cave um which is literally what they're rebuilding from is so cool yeah it's um, insane. yeah so again yeah i mean i shed all over the place like so again if i was making art i'm sure i would leave a hair <laughs> or two lying around uh so this is where not just the panel but then also we need to look at the bigger context so can we do some work there there is an incredible um like a new set of testing called the Raman spectrometry that some colleagues of mine have been doing recently. And it's, it's blowing my mind. Like, did you know it? So it's basically, they put a laser into the wall and it analyzes. Okay. The best way to describe it, you know, like when you're looking at exoplanets and they're able mm -hmm. to say it has an atmosphere of this and it has that on it. So every single element, all of these little molecular structures, they, they have their own signature. Right. And so this is the same thing, but on a cave wall, so they can see the signature of, say, ochre, which is iron oxide. They can see mm -hmm. that. They can see the structures of, um, you know, if there's any little fungi growing or any carbon material. They can also find saliva. You know that? Wow. Yes. That's um, crazy. I know. I think they can actually, they can literally identify saliva because it has a specific chemical signature. It's, it's right. incredible. So to me as well and it's right on the cutting edge of something you can take into a cave um i have a colleague who just did it in northern spain um and they're just getting the results now so very early days but this is again where this cave might be a great opportunity for us to build some new gear because what we need mm -hmm. is a little spider robot you know like those boston <laughs> dynamics dogs but with like more yeah. legs something that could go into a cave and like plant itself because it needs to be very still in there um but i would love to see what the ronman results are from that wall or there's other things like um, portable XRF that you can do as well. So these are all things where we can literally figure out what is that sediment on the wall? Did it come from right. the floor? We can check. Where did it come from? Did it come from the floor? Did it come from outside? Um, is there any genetic material mixed in with it? Possibly, right? So these are all tests that we can do. Um, and again, they might fail. They might succeed. They might be something you have to try a couple different times. Um, but 100% need to be testing that as well to see you know what what's going on on these walls um when it comes to that and if there's any if there's any saliva or genetic material at all i mean oh my gosh paleogenetics here we go yeah right? seriously yeah. yeah now so we've talked a little bit about you know what we would do and, and we've established i think quite strongly that the door is open testing needs to be done that's kind of all that's been said right now yep now so let's, for right now, jump a little bit into the future yes. and say that 
we have more evidence to support that these engravings were Naledi created. Yeah. And we, we like, let's just say, we can think with an 80% surety, Naledi made these engravings. Yeah. What does that mean for the field of paleo art and human cognition oh, as we know I, it? Yeah, I mean, whew, it would be good. It would be cool. Okay. <laughs> So the way I've been describing it to people is, I mean, human evolution is not really a tree anymore. I think we've realized it's more like a river delta or something where everything keeps kind of going in and out. But let's we'll keep, let's stick with the tree analogy for now. So ourselves, Neanderthals, Neanderthals, we're all here. We're like on the end of the branch, right? What makes the Letty so fascinating is it might be over here, like on a different branch. We don't know yet. Um, I know there is some genetic testing underway. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. we might have some answers to that like how closely related but you know i think this goes back to that idea of like we need to have a conversation as a discipline we need to really maybe we need to revisit yeah like what who who are these graphic mark making people right yeah. um and, and let go of the human the human bias it's got to be humans um okay going on record here <laughs> this is just me. Other people might disagree, and that's totally a lot. I mean, that's what science is, right? I mean, right. I think is the entire point of science. Um, you know what I mean? That's why I say, like, everything I think I know, I can be proved wrong tomorrow, and that's okay, because that's the whole point of science, right? Which is, if we have new data, we can do new things, right? Yeah, yeah. So my thought, based on what I have been seeing, not only with Homo sapien, but with the very high possibility that Neanderthals are making art as well. I mean, I, I think they were. Like, I think I'm, I'm, I'm academically hedging right now, but I mean, if we're going to be really straight, I think Neanderthals made art. So I think we just have to catch up and prove it <laughs> completely. But, <laughs> but again, there's episodes, some, but, yeah, you know, there's some yeah. good stuff going on there. And I think Neanderthals, I think are very close to having, having their day of like the mea culpa <laughs> of that. Um, and again, one of the, um, I work with the first art team in Spain, uh, well, it's actually an international mm -hmm. team, but a lot of them are in Spain and Portugal. And I mean, literally the entire point of the first art team is that we are all saying this, that literally, this is why I know what all these tests are. We've been throwing the whole kitchen sink at Neanderthals. Like we've already been right. doing this. And so in a way, all that stuff we developed for Neanderthals, we can now turn around and there's no reason it can't be used to study the Naledi question, right? Mm -hmm. So these these are all things that have already been developed and or in process or things we've been brainstorming about, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had? Um, so I think the groundwork is already there. But based on what I have seen in Europe and in Asia, potentially with the Denisovans, with, with, again, those glimmers in the archaeological record that are older, my feeling is that I really do think that there was a common ancestor who was the first graphic mark maker. I think we've just, we've underestimated the age. And I think it goes back to that question of sometimes you don't find things you're not looking for. Um, and, and, and that, you know, nobody thought that they were doing it. Therefore, they weren't looking for marks that were non-utilitarian. They probably would have just thought they were butchering marks or things like that. And then there's all the problems of what if they were doing it on like, you know perishable materials like on skins or on their own body like we wouldn't right, know right so that's always a problem um and again this doesn't mean that it was a more developed system but i i suspect and so again this is at this point this is just a feeling i have no proof um but down the road i would hope that we i think this is something that could be addressed i do really do think this is the perfect opportunity for us to be like okay who, what, where, when, <laughs> like, when did this actually happen? Because if we've got humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans all making marks, um, and in a way, the earliest ones are all so similar too. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So we've got this, these early similarities, and then it's almost, which, and again, this makes perfect sense. As they split off into the world and go their own way, they start to develop their own cultures, their own artistic or graphic traditions. Things move in different directions depending on what's important to each group. I mean, we even see that within humans, right? Like human groups don't all do the same types of 
art or graphic mark making. Some of them, right. you know, there's there's groups that don't do anything figurative. There's other groups who do incredible stuff, um, but then destroy it afterwards. Like we all have, all these different groups have different ways of expressing their graphic marks. And that's just within humans. So on that larger scale, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to say that each of them would have used them in a way that was meaningful and useful for them, right? Like, I think there is always that, you know, if it wasn't useful, they would have ditched it. <laughs> I think yeah. There, was, yeah. there was something about it that made it useful. Um, so to me, I was already leaning towards the idea that there is somewhere out there, there is an older ancestor who probably really was that very first mark maker. Like when I sort of talked to, I think before my TED talk was somewhere, somewhere <laughs> back in time, somebody had a, you know, had a rock or something could be or a piece of, you know, piece of wood or whatever and made it a mark. And like, yeah, that was the inflection point. That was the change. That was the first point. Um, and I think if if the Naledi engravings do prove to be intentional and and we've ruled out the idea that Homo sapien or somebody else made them, um, then I, I think this adds a really important conversation piece to that who, what, where, <laughs> who, what, where, when, why, what was going on, um, you know, and it might be kind of like, but I mean, I think that's like such a trend in our field, isn't that? Like, yeah. Everything is older than we thought it was. And and, mm -hmm. and that the mm -hmm. new data comes in. And again, I'm not even like slamming previous generations of researchers because everybody's always been working with the data they had available, right? Right. And and back in the day, there was no carbon dating. They were just sort of having to figure out, well, what came before what? You know, that was their stylistic. Then they get carbon, but you can only use that on black paint or black things, which are made of like charcoal or, or other organics. And again, there's a really low ceiling on it. You can only date up to about 40,000 or so before you run out of material. So anything older than that, we didn't know. And, and now we've got uranium series. And yes, there are some concerns with that. But overall, it's being refined. It's getting better. Uranium series has now opened up red paint. It's opened up engravings. Anything where something gets covered, we can date, right? Um, and then frankly, genetics. Because what we can do with the genetics, and this is where I think it's one of the most fun things. I mean, other than be really cool to actually be like, I know exactly who this person was and like, you know, what lines they're from, which is really cool. Um, there's also the fact that we have quite good records now of when different mutations happen. So right. we can use it to age bracket things as well. If we can find genetic mm. material, we can often have a sense of, well, this mutation hasn't happened yet, so it must be older than X, which is right, really neat right. too. So I think that as part of this, um, when we talked about that before, like that idea that what we need to be doing here is basically taking all these different strands of evidence and braiding them together. Like that's what we should be doing. That's how you build a solid argument is that you, you look at not just one thing, but does this, you know, does this support that thing? Does, you know, how do we bring them all together? And I think that's what makes Naledi honestly really exciting is that that site has not been screwed up yet. <laughs> and I don't mean that meanly, but there are sites in the world where unfortunately they were excavated over a hundred years ago. Right, um, right. You know, I mean, gosh, you know this probably. Some of the oldest paleo sites were excavated by dynamite. Yeah. I right? Mean, I think even um, where Sediba was found by uh, Lee was dynamite. Yeah. Right? Like, so again... You know, our excavation techniques may have improved slightly since then. Slightly. Uh, just a slightly. little bit. So, you know, I think, again, we're, this is such a wonderful opportunity to go do it right. And yeah. and it is it is such a pristine area. There's so few humans have ever been in there that we know of. Um, but, you know, like, again, that there's a very, it's a very enclosed site. It's very difficult to get into. So that also helps protect it. And so to me, if I'm pulling back, I think that what this does is this again that 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 allows us to move into this new era where we're like more inclusive in a way of mm -hmm. okay who was making graphic marks let's let's be open minded about this then and not automatically you know be like oh that's preposterous anytime it's not modern humans um and so I think that's where Naledi is just a really interesting challenge to what we thought we knew um you know and and i mean but it's it's the ultimate what is that expression um sometimes you don't even know what you don't know and i think yeah. naledi is like literally that um and so 
right? Isn't that fun? Yeah, I love that expression. And, and I feel like paleoanthropology is like that a lot, where you're like, oh, we didn't even know it was a thing that there was art in Indonesia, right? Like yeah, until yeah. there is. <laughs> and so to me, this in a way, it seems almost inevitable. And if it's not in the Letty, I think other sites will continue to pop up now that we're, mm-hmm. we're we're getting better and we're also using predictive modeling and we're doing other things that are allowing us to better predict where would you find these sites because they're hard to find they're so buried right, underground right. there's you know so i think that if if naledi if those engravings prove to be purposeful and likely to have been made by naledi um and to be that old um then i mean i think it opens up just a really great new set of dialogues to be had and then also new research avenues to explore um including what what kind of brain do you need to make marks right right which Which, is really interesting too uh i don't have too much time left i know before we we can keep going but let's finish with (laughs) cognition though do you want to finish with cognition yes one thing that i wanted to i saw chris stringer say this today or in my yesterday and he said so if we were already making these marks and doing all of these cognitively advanced things 300,000 years ago with brains the size of slightly larger than chimpanzees, yeah. what's the rest of our brain for if we were already that advanced? Why, you know, why have we maintained something that is so calorically expensive and mm-hmm. so hard to maintain if we were functioning at a level that was already more than we imagined possible so Mm -hmm. i think that opens a lot of that's a good question you know what's actually i think maybe neuroscience has a lot more to explain still of what's going on even today in our modern brain yeah no and also i mean i think that the the key here and i've really found in the last few years that some of the best projects i've worked on are ones that are very interdisciplinary where mm-hmm. I'm working with, like, I'm working on one project now, which I can't even say much about, but it involves AI. And so I'm mm-hmm. actually working with people from way on the other side of the fields, right? But fascinating to see how they see the world and, like, what they can bring to the table. And I feel like that's exactly what's needed in this case, too, is that neuroscience is going to be very central to this. Um, now, I'm by no means an expert in this kind of stuff, but I do know that a lot of the Place, like parts of the brain associated with graphic communication and communication are more like back here i feel like they're mm-hmm. more over the ears right like broca's area and there's like where nikki's and like there's a few different areas that are, and they're more here ish so it's not so much frontal lobe but more re- i mean they're part of it but right, right. there's any endocast possibilities so endocast of course is when you do it inside of the you know, the inside of the skull, and then you can sort of figure out what bits of brain were there. Um, But, you know, I mean, that certainly is something that needs to be done. I think as well, though, I mean, evolution moves very slowly, and we forget Mm -hmm. that sometimes, which is that, you know, it can take hundreds of thousands of years for any actual change to really kick in. And so, we we ha- I mean it's, it's why you know so many people have problems with like lactose or like gluten or like things like that is because it hasn't really been that long that we've been eating those foods or doing those and certainly from an evolutionary point of view so to see the first glimmers of behavior like that at 500,000 plus I mean or 300,000 in Naledi's case maybe 500,000 in other parts of the world even um it doesn't surprise me that maybe at first everything was a very very slow just kind of plugging along you know um i mean elephants even have burial areas right that they, but like i like i think we need to remember that which is that there's there's so much complexity in brains not just mm-hmm. human brains but other brains and and we're again we, i think we we're just we had our little humans or special glasses on before <laughs> and so <laughs> we weren't looking at some things so i think in that sense as well now that we're approaching things a bit differently i'm I'm interested to see um but again there's i mean there's a site in in spain that i mentioned that i've, I've had the chance to see in person which is really fun which is like out of puerca um right. and so i got to go to cima de las Poesos, which is the pit of bones is what that means 
and there that's the one where there is like there's over 20 individuals for sure mm-hmm. that were all stuck into this pit now they weren't buried but they may have been intentionally placed there is kind of the thing and so the question is did they shove them there because <laughs> they smelled bad and they wanted to get them out of the way so the <laughs> predators didn't come or were they doing it because this is where they deposited their dead right, right. and that's for 450 450 years ago mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so we're seeing these there's glimmers that's what i mean there's glimmers or i've also had the chance i've gotten through so many cool places do you, you know this you know the site of school do you know what that yes. is yes right so school is literally for the audience one of the oldest human homo sapien burials in the world it's in israel it's around 120 130 000. um and again there are a couple of little geometric markings on a couple of portable artifacts from there so just before we get too you know too precious about it there those burials are 120 130 000 years old um there's Neanderthal burials not too far from there, I think in Kapse Cave, mm-hmm. that are even older. Like there's there's a lot going on. And so I, I think it's just that because like our civilization now is literally moving at the pace of like a car with no brakes. Like <laughs> like we <laughs> we're because we're we're also almost like forcing our evolution now in a way by because yeah. we've now we've 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 bypassed Darwinism and we've moved into literally starting to take control of our own evolution with all of the technology we use and so i think what we forget is that sometimes i mean there's like the old if it ain't broke don't fix it so like things can carry on for really long periods of time often with evolution without there being some big jump until maybe there was some reason why it became more important and things that maybe started out without necessarily having the same intention could suddenly have become useful for different reasons later. Like there's so many things that are going on. I mean, what's that fish, that crazy fish that makes the most incredible mandala looking things in the sand to attract a mate? Like, oh. do you know what I'm talking about? There's some sort mm-hmm. of fish. Like, I'm, I'm just hearing why? David Attenborough's voice describe it, you know? Yes, that's um, exactly where I saw it too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Again, like like that pattern is bonkers. The complexity mm-hmm. of it, and it's it's a fish doing it to attract a mate, and then it's gone, right? Yeah. So I think this is where again we 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 oh, there's just so much we don't know. I think that's what I'm trying mm-hmm. to say is we need to be open minded, and again, but like Chris said, and that's really important, which is we do we we need to question everything, and we we do need to have our skeptic hats and glasses on for sure but still being open-minded and then i think being really curious i mean i think that's Mm -hmm. what science is right is being really curious and just being like okay well what tests can we do what what ways can we approach this what other what other groups of people might we be able to bring in from different disciplines who might have something to add that we never thought of absolutely yeah Yeah. and i think that that's going to be the way forward so how's that i'm excited i'm excited it's exciting times it's absolutely it you know I it I'm so fortunate that I'm finding this right as all of this is kicking off you know it's all of us who are in this field right now I think even those who might not be on the side of the Naledi evidence are still finding it's a very exciting time to be in the science yep Uh, yep and you know just real quickly before we do go there is just I'm a little disappointed in a side of certain people that I'm seeing that are so just against the openness of what is being done. Yeah. Like, it, I understand that they want the results to be as conclusive as possible mm-hmm. before the yep. public knows because they don't want to have to roll back what was said. But yep. if we're all learning together at the same time going forward, then... I don't see the problem. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where this is part of that bigger conversation. This is honestly a bigger conversation, I think, for science, mm-hmm. which is that, you know, traditionally we hung out in our little, what they call the ivory tower. Right, the ivory right? tower. And, mm-hmm. and we did smart science things. And then, <laughs> and then once we were done, we'd be like, and here's what we found right yeah and then the audience you know the public well done right and then we would carry on or people would not like it but you know generally the public 
got the final result. But I feel like in this day and age with digital media, with the internet, um, and like I said, the world population is smart and well educated. Mm-hmm. Like, and I think there's a genuine interest in this. Um, I see this more as an opportunity, but I think maybe that's again a very part of that 21st century new way of looking at what what does it mean to do science and research. Yeah, and and, and so I think that's part of that bigger conversation. Which again, I, I do understand that we don't want to misinform people. Exactly. But, right. but if it's handled properly, I feel like saying, hey, do you want to come and join us on this right. incredible, exciting adventure? We have no idea what we're going to find, but it's going to be a wild <laughs> ride, right? Like, right, like I think exactly. if, you, if you word it that way, then it's honestly an amazing opportunity for people too to see what does it mean to do science? What does it mean to have disagreements with your colleagues? What does it mean to have your test fail and then you have to go back and figure out how to do it again like there is no fail in science we learn something from everything but sometimes we do have to regroup and then approach it a different way and that's not a bad thing that's how we learn and so in a way getting to share that with the world as we do this is to me an amazing opportunity how's that absolutely you know and i don't think we could end on a better note about naledi than that So, you know, everyone just, there's been so much Naledi news. Uh, We're going to be covering more content about it. And I do want to let everyone know that that Q&A that Genevieve and I are promising is still coming up. (laughs) We just, I don't know how we could possibly have ignored the Naledi news in the meantime. No, No. especially because, I mean, it is geometric signs, right? So it's like, oh, it's so perfect. Yeah, but no, 100%, we owe people Ice Age Art Europe we will we'll we'll give everybody the 411 on it we'll do that next time for sure and i love absolutely. answering questions I'm, I'm amped about that that'll be fun absolutely so you can still send those questions in just email yeah. them to world of paleoanthropology at gmail.com yeah. and uh, we'll see you next time thanks Perfect. everyone <laughs>